Thanks so much, Seth. And I want to make sure uh, that, that we cover today a, a whole bunch of different opportunities that you have to help manage your loans if you're in distress. But I wanted to start by walking through some of the specific elements of this new federal law that just passed to uh, protect borrowers uh, with certain federal loans. And so uh, as Seth mentioned, not everybody, and Congressman Porter mentioned, not everybody's covered by this. Uh, but for those that are, interest is suspended. Um, your automatic payments uh, are supposed to have been stopped, so we hear that that has not happened for everybody. Um, and the months that you spend not making payments right up through the end of September are supposed to qualify for loan forgiveness, both public service loan forgiveness and loan forgiveness if you're enrolled in an income-driven payment plan. And uh, there's a lot of jargon on this slide. My colleague Cody at Student Debt Crisis is going to walk through it all if this means when I'm done. Um, but just know that these are the new protections that have been lost since March 26th. For borrowers that are in default, there's another set of protections. Um, there's supposed to be a ban on wage garnishment and on the seizure of tax refunds and other benefits. Um, most importantly, uh, it, it helps to know that, that this hasn't actually been rolled out particularly smoothly and that there are borrowers that may still be getting wage garnished, wages garnished or their automatic payments pulled out of their account. Uh, it's really important to ask for help if you run into trouble um, and we'll have more information at the end of this call about where to go for help. Um, it's, it's also important to know whether or not you're covered by the CARES Act. Uh, so again, all of this information is going to be available uh, on, on all of our different websites um, and, and it's going to get circulated to folks after this call. But um, if you have a loan made by the Department of Education or owned by the Department of Education you're in, if you have a loan that's been made by your school through the Perkins program um, or a loan made by a bank or another private student lender that's not owned by the Department of Education, uh, or if you have a private student loan, um, none of those are covered in the CARES Act. Uh, and, and so with that, I, I'm actually going to talk a little bit more now um, about what to do if you have a private student loan in particular and you're in distress. Um, if you could jump a couple more slides up, well, sorry about that. So um, there are millions of borrowers out there that have private student loans. And these are loans that are not made by the federal government. They're not guaranteed by the federal government and they don't have the same protections that are available to borrowers who are um, struggling with a federal student loan. So you don't have a right to make payments based on your income. You don't have a right for loan forgiveness if you become disabled or if you work in public service. Uh, there, there really aren't the same kind of protections entitled under federal law but you may still have options. Um, some common options include uh, interest only payments, uh, forbearances in the event of an economic hardship. Um, and I think it's important to know that each of these programs are a little bit different depending on who your company is. Uh, but the California Department of Business Oversight, the regulator for student loan servicers in the state of California, um, announced just two days ago that for borrowers with private student loans and borrowers with the kinds of federal loans not covered by the CARES Act, um, they now have a right no questions asked to get forbearance um, if they're having trouble paying their bills during the course of this pandemic. Um, all you need to do is contact your private student loan company and the biggest private student loan companies have all committed to offering relief for California borrowers. Um, so that's the good news. The challenging part is that uh, every company is still gonna, gonna figure out what relief means to them. Uh, and it can be really complicated to be able to get somebody on the phone, to get them to take your call and to be able to act on that information. Uh, in a way that, that actually makes a difference. And so uh, we also encourage folks, if something doesn't seem right, um, we'll talk more about opportunities to get help at the end of this, but but there there are resources and, and it's not always clear that you can rely on your student loan company to do the right thing if you don't know what to ask for and you don't know where to go for help. If you wanna jump to the next slide. Um, we do know that if you're in default on a private student loan, um, things are a little bit more complicated, even if you're just uh, uh, otherwise just making payments and, and everything's okay. It's hard to figure out how to make ends meet um, in a crisis like this. But if you're in default, things can get really complicated. Um, you don't have the same rights if you've defaulted on a private student loan uh, that borrowers with federal student loans do. Um, again, you are gonna be potentially contacted by a debt collector, uh, and you may even be sued to try to, to recover a private student loan that you've defaulted on. Um, we suspect things are gonna get a lot worse before they get better uh, for borrowers with defaulted private loans, but uh, do know that some private lenders have said that they're gonna halt debt collection lawsuits, at least for a little while, 
Um, that's not good enough, uh, but it is a step and it shows that some of the largest creditors in the private student loan market are watching to see what borrowers do. And by banding together and making noise and calling on industry to treat people fairly, um, hopefully we can come up with a better way forward for defaulted private student loan borrowers. Uh, we're also including in the slide deck contact information for the biggest student loan companies. These are the federal government student loan contractors, but they all uh, or largely also handle private student loans and other kinds of federal loans the government doesn't own. Um, these are the email addresses for uh, escalated customer service folks, as well as the Twitter handles for these companies. We've seen that by contacting your student loan company on Twitter, you often are able to get a much better result than if you just call the call center and sit on hold and talk to somebody that doesn't necessarily know what they're talking about or uh, isn't able to help you. Uh, so we strongly encourage if you've run into trouble, do all of these things, send an email, um, tweet at them on social media, uh, use the call center. I think uh, every company is a little bit different right now, but we've heard in particular that the, the delays in contacting people and getting help at Fed loan servicing are particularly egregious. And so um, I, I strongly encourage if you have a, a loan that's serviced by Fed loan servicing, um, Twitter is, is probably your best place to be able to get help. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to turn this over now to uh, my colleague, uh, Cody at Student Debt Crisis who's going to talk a little bit more about student loan repayment basics and all the rights that borrowers have always had to manage their student loans uh, that are particularly important in the current crisis. Thank you, Mike. I very much appreciate it. Uh, my name is Cody Hunanian. I am the program director here at Student Debt Crisis. We've been hosting these workshops for years. Um, you know, typically we don't have to address the additional information that comes with the crisis. So we are going to go quickly over these basics. You can always reach out to us at Student Debt Crisis if you have additional questions. Uh, so most importantly, when it comes to what relief, when it comes to the emergency relief, and also when it comes to the standard repayment options available to federal student loans, it's going to be what type of student loan you have. So first, you have federal student loans, and you have private student loans. And as you've heard, there's a great difference there. Federal student loans have a wide variety of consumer protections and repayment options that are available to them. While private student loans don't necessarily have that uh, laid out into regulation, each loan, each private lender has their own set of options and rules. And as Mike noted, that even applies now during today's COVID-19 crisis. Federal student loan emergency relief options are written into law and private lenders have their own piecemeal options that they provide company to company. So if we can go to the next slide, I can help try to break down the many types of federal student loans that are in existence. So for many of us that have newer student loans, and this is student loans after 2010, some of them were before that, they're called direct student loans. These are the kind that the Department of Education gives to students directly. The Department of Ed funds these loans on their own. This was a small minority of loans prior to 2010, and after that, all federal student loans were what we call direct student loans. And that includes direct loans, direct Stafford loans for undergraduate students, direct Parent PLUS loans for parents who are funding a child's education, direct graduate loans, those are for graduate students, and direct consolidation loans. That's when a borrower takes multiple student loans or a previous federal student loan and consolidates it into a new direct loan. Now on the next slide, there's several other federal student loans that have existed and continue to uh, exist in the portfolio. You will see there's a whole system called the Federal Family Education Loan. Now, previously the Federal Family Education Loans were awarded via the Department of Education, so you would contact the Department of Education to get these loans but the funds were provided by private banks. Similarly, there's another type of loan called a Perkins loan, and that's a type of loan, a federal loan, that you would get the funds from your university or institution directly. And as Mike noted, these types of federal loans may still be held by a private banking institution. And if that's the case, you don't necessarily qualify for the recent COVID-19 emergency relief. Some of them were purchased back from the Department of Education and are now what we call federally held. 
And if you have an FFEL loan or a Perkins loan that is federally held, you do qualify for the CARES Act relief that was passed by Congress. Now I'm gonna be moving forward in what are just our standard repayment options. And so I wanna note that what we're gonna discuss moving forward have been the standard options available to folks prior to this crisis and continue to exist. And if you have the loans that do not qualify for CARES Act relief, it does not mean that you don't qualify for any of the federal repayment options I'm about to discuss. Now, it's a lot of information, and it's a lot of information to know just about your own student loan situation. So if you go to studentaid.gov and you log into your account, or you create a new account if you haven't logged in before, you can learn all about the type of student loan you have, you can learn about what type of repayment program you're in, and that is the direct to source information about all of the federal repayment programs, federal repayment options, and COVID-19 emergency relief. So studentaid.gov is your trusted source for Department of Education information. It can be dense, so then you can reach out to nonprofits and advocates like those on the call today to help make sense of the information you find there. So when folks uh, enter repayment, uh, I'll show you all on the next slide. These are the options that exist. People start out in what we call the standard repayment plan, and that is 10 years of the same monthly payment at the same rate, and by the end of 10 years, you pay off your student loan. Now, there are other repayment options that exist. There's a repayment option called extended repayment. Now, extended repayment is when a borrower can lower their monthly payments by extending the amount of years that they are paying their loan. So you go from 10 years under the standard repayment option to 20 years or more under the extended repayment option. There's also an option to do graduated repayments. That means your loans start off at a lower rate and over the years they increase in your total monthly payment due. Now, if you expect that you'll have a major increase in income in the future, that may be a plan that works for you but it also could set up a situation where borrowers have high student loan payments in the future that they aren't expecting. We are gonna really focus in on just a moment on what we call income-driven repayment plans. And income-driven repayment plans are tied to your individual yearly, in or excuse me, your yearly income and your family size instead of your total loan balance. And that can make your payments more affordable and that is even more important now during the COVID-19 crisis. So first, just to really send this home, borrowers who start their repayment are automatically in the 10-year standard repayment. That means the same monthly payment every month for 10 years. And on the next slide, just to reiterate, we have extended repayment, we have graduated repayment, and we have extended graduated repayment options. And we tend to note these because these are options for student loan borrowers, but they aren't always the best option for borrowers who are facing long-term difficulties affording their payments. Similarly, on the next slide, we have options that exist for borrowers that are facing temporary hardships. Now these are called deferment and forbearance, and under a deferment, you can temporarily pause or lower your payments. And if you have a subsidized loan by the federal government, you will not see interest accrue during that time. Forbearance is similar. You'll have a temporary pause or lower payments, but the interest accrues during this time. Now, why, the reason we don't necessarily recommend these options as opposed to the income-driven repayment plan is that deferment and forbearance are short-term options. There's only a limited amount of time that you can enroll in these options. And also you're gonna see in an upcoming slide when we get to public service loan forgiveness program that these types of repayment options do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So I just wanna quickly note that these options exist, but I'm gonna spend a little extra time going over income-driven repayment plans. So that's on the next slide. Income-driven repayment plans set monthly payments based on your discretionary income rather than your outstanding loan balance. Now that means that your loan could be as little as $0 per month 
And particularly during a time of crisis like now, when folks are seeing their jobs cut, their hours cut, this is a type of program that could come into handy. And borrowers can enroll in this program at any time, meaning if you're facing an income shock, you can enroll in this program immediately to lower your monthly payments. At the end of an income-driven repayment plan, which are 20 or 25 years in length, the remaining debt is forgiven. And if you qualify for public service loan forgiveness, you can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan for 10 years and have the remaining debt forgiven after 10 years. So on the next slide, I'm gonna break down the several programs that ex have existed. Now at the bottom of this chart is the oldest income-driven repayment plan it is called income contingent repayment. Now that is calculated as 20% of your discretionary income and the repayment schedule is 25 years. Over time, the federal government introduced newer, more generous programs. And you can see that the newest programs, revised pay as you earn and pay as you earn, are only 10% of your discretionary income and the re max payment time frame is only 20 years. So over time, we made these programs more affordable and we made the repayment schedule less. Now, if you go to the next slide, you can see just how powerful these programs are and why it's so important in a time like the COVID-19 crisis. A borrower with $30,000 in income would typically have a 10-year standard payment of $359 a month. In an IDR plan, they can have zero dollar payments. Now I know many of us with qualifying federal loans are gonna have six months of suspended payments because of the COVID-19 relief that was offered in the CARES Act. But if you're experiencing an income shock now, you can enroll in a zero dollar payment for income driven repayment plan, and that will last for the next year. So that will ensure that six months after the CARES Act relief ends, you still have an affordable payment. And so if you look at this chart, you can see that even people that have up to $70,000 in income can have some of their monthly payment reduced under one of these plans. So many of you are probably asking what is discretionary income and how are these payments calculated? So discretionary income is your adjusted gross income that is the income that you file in your tax returns. Now they subtract off from that 150% of the poverty guideline for your family size. If you look online, there is a poverty index that says what the poverty line is for, every, for each family size. So you take that, you times it by 150%, and you subtract that from your income. That is your discretionary income. So that, based on that income, the federal government calculates 10% or 15% to find out what your monthly payments will be. And again, you can see there, for a single borrower earning less than $19,000, your payments are $0. For a family of four earning less than $39,000, payments are $0. So this is hugely powerful. And if your family is experiencing impact to your income because of COVID-19, it's really important that you know that these options exist on top of the CARES Act relief that was passed in Congress. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see a quick tool that we want to make sure that you all know about. And that tool is called the Repayment Calculator. And again, this is at the Department website at studentaid.gov. And you put in your family size, your income, your total student debt, and some other information. And what comes out is a chart that lets you know all of the repayment options available to you, as well as all of the uh, opportunities on forgiveness. So I encourage everyone, because this is a lot of information, please visit studentaid.gov and make sure that you understand all of the repayment options you qualify for as a federal student loan borrower. Now on the next slide, I'm gonna quickly just address the qualifications for these plans. Each one has a different set of qualifications and you're gonna to wanna to know which one you qualify for. So 
So the older program, Income Contingent Repayment, which is at the bottom there, we call it ICR, all federal student loans qualify. The newer program, Income Based Repayment, which we call IBR, all federal student loans qualify for that as well, but you do have to show that you have a partial financial hardship. That means there will be some income information required to qualify for that program. In the more generous pay as you earn program, you need to have a direct loan, which is a type of federal student loan. You need to have a partial financial hardship and you need to have a student loan that was issued more recently. They fixed some of those uh, exclusionary qualifications and in the new revised pay as you earn, what we call repay, they made sure that anyone with a direct loan could qualify. Again, all this information is at studentaid.gov and so for those of you that are overwhelmed by this information, like most are, go there and learn more about your options. So I'm going to quickly just explain how you can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan. There are two different options. You can go online at the Department of Education's website or through your student loan servicer's website to access a digital application. By doing so, it taps into the IRS database and it can even auto fill out a lot of your information. For others, you're gonna to want to use the paper application. Now, people who wanna use a paper application are those that have irregular income and are gonna to need to provide additional income information like pay stubs, tax returns, other information to qualify for a lower payment. Both of those options, again, are available at studentaid.gov. So again, the online application, visit studentaid.gov. Uh, if you have multiple student loans or if you're a returning borrower, uh, a lot of the information will be there and it will help streamline the, op the application process. And if we can just move forward a couple of slides, uh, the paper application, again, is down, you can download it online or request it from your student loan servicer. And the last bit is I just want to really send home an important part of an income driven repayment plan. When you s apply for an income driven repayment plan, that certifies your monthly payment for an entire year. And you have to recertify your income every year to stay in this program. If you miss your recertification, you can still enroll, but it can add interest that accrued by capitalizing it to your principal balance. So there's some consequences if you miss your payment or your, excuse me, your recertification. So we really tell folks on, as soon as you, you certify for your income during repayment plan, put it on your calendar, make sure that you're ready to recertify within the 12 month time frame so that you're staying enrolled and not having any of the additional consequences. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Executive Director Natalia Abrams to go over some additional topics like defaults and public service loan forgiveness. Thank you so much, Cody. And we'll go very quickly because we see a lot of your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and also all of these slides will be available uh, after this workshop. So, you know, we just wanna uh, reiterate that, you know, things have changed with the CARES Act. So everything that just uh, Cody just talked about with income-based repayment programs, if you have federal loans that qualify during the six month pause, um, this time will count towards your payment. Um, you know, what you can see here on the screen now is student loan default, which we know a lot, a lot of you are in, and almost, you know, more than 8 million student loan borrowers are in default currently right now. And it, it's not a pretty thing to be in. You know, you become in, eligible for financial aid, uh, your wage, gar, wages can be garnished, um, you, fees can be added, it can, you know, the credit reporting, the good news right now is that if you have federal loans that qualify, they are pausing wage garnishment, or they should be. Um, if you are struggling with that, please contact you know someone from our group to respond to this email if they are still withholding your garnishment, but that is one of the new um, things that have changed in the CARES Act. And if we can go to the next slide. So uh, also there's a program uh, called uh, default rehabilitation. So you can do two things to get out of default. You can consolidate your loan into a new loan, 
you uh, need an eligible loan, you need to enroll in an uh, income-driven repayment plan, one of the federal plans Cody just spoke about, um, and you can't have had wage garnishment start. Um, but if you have, or if you're already in rehabilitation, uh, this is a nine-month program, or uh, actually 10 months, you have 10 months to make nine payments. Um, they base it on your uh, current income and your expenses. So this is where they actually take a look at your, um, you know, housing and healthcare, and they'll take a look at your bills. Your payments can be as low as five months, or five dollars, excuse me, per month after nine months. I, again, if you have a qualifying loan right now during the CARES Act, you will have your six months um, of zero. You'll be able to pay zero dollars, and that will still count towards default rehabilitation. So, if you're currently in rehabilitation and you have a qualifying federal loan. Your payments right now and rehabilitation will be paused. Moving forward. So there's another uh, program that is offered for federal student loans. Uh, it's public service loan forgiveness. This program started October 1st, 2007. Uh, it, it requires 10 years of payments, 120 uh, on-time monthly payments, and after this, all of your debt is forgiven tax-free. And to qualify for public service, you need to have the correct job, be in the correct loan, and have the correct correct repayment program. If, and you'll see on the next slide, Uh, that combining what Cody talked about, income-driven repayment programs, which will base your loan on your income versus your overall loan amount, with public service loan forgiveness, will give you the maximum benefit that the federal government offers right now for federal student loans. Moving forward. So here are the basics. Uh, like I mentioned, you need to have the correct loan, which is a direct student loan. These are um, these loans were largely issued after 2010. Um, some were issued before. Uh, you can also consolidate into a direct loan uh, uh, that instead of the federal family education loans that Cody discussed earlier, you need to have the direct loan. Then you want to make sure your employer qualifies. Do you work uh, for a city, state? federal government? Are you a public school teacher? Do you work at a nonprofit hospital? Do you work for a nonprofit 501c3? Uh, there are many public service jobs that uh, qualify. Um, and after you qualify your employment, the next step is to make sure you're in the right repayment program. All of the newer income-driven repayment programs qualify. Those are the you know, income-based repayment, pay as you earn, repay, they qualify. In addition to that, the standard repayment program qualifies. However, that's a 10-year program, so that's why we suggest the max benefit of combining it with an income-driven repayment program so you can have the lowest payments possible and receive the max benefit. Uh, then you should uh, submit an employee employer certification form. This will uh, make sure that your employers uh, qualify. It will make sure that you're dotting all your I's, crossing all your T's. And at this point, your loan servicer may actually change to Fed loan servicing. So that's always something to look out for. People don't realize that they can go from, you know, Navient to a separate loan servicer. And then once that is over, uh, you apply. And at, once you've hit your 120 payments and are granted public service loan forgiveness. They forgive the remaining amount after 10 years, and as mentioned before, it is completely tax-free. Moving on. So we touched on this, but just to go over again, um, so we touched on what qualifies, which uh, does, you know, qualifies as direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans, graduate plus loans, direct parent plus loans, and direct consolidated loans all levels of government, C3 nonprofits, um, and income-driven repayment programs and the standard repayment or qualifying repayment plan.
And what does not qualify are Perkins loans. That has an asterisk because if you've consolidated your Perkins loan into a new direct consolidated loan, then that will qualify. The older federal family education loans, unless you've consolidated them, you need to be in good standing, so no loans in default qualify, and this is for federal student loans only. Um, if you are a government contractor, uh, it, then you don't qualify. If you work for the labor union, uh, it doesn't mean if you're a member of a labor union, but if you work directly for the labor unions, you'll not qualify. And any time spent on the pulpit does not qualify. The last section of the plans, this is where we have worked with so many borrowers and they get confused because they have a federal loan and they have the correct job, but they may have enrolled in one of these older repayment programs. That's why we suggest, you know, just for max benefit to take a look at the newer income driven repayment programs. Because as you can see, these programs do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Moving forward. Also, also before all of this, there was a fix um, for public service loan forgiveness, but it was on a first time first serve basis. It is still not um, completely used up. And those uh, who may have had the correct loan um, and the correct job, but they were in one of those extended graduated repayment programs, there is a chance that you could still now qualify for public service loan forgiveness. If you feel that you have been incorrectly, like unfairly denied in this program, please email us at info at studentdebtcrisis.org so we can get you to the right folks. And lastly, we'll just quickly go over different other types of discharge. If you are totally and permanently disabled, you are able to have your loans discharged. Uh, for federal loans, unfortunately, not necessarily all private loans, you, if you pass away, your loans are discharged. If somebody has taken a loan out in your name um, and you didn't attend that school and you didn't take out that loan, you can also have it discharged. Uh, if your school has closed, uh, we work with many groups that work on defense repayment or bar borrower's defense. Um, you are entitled to a, a refund of your federal loans. Um, so these are just other types of discharges, as you know, our speakers have said, have always existed and still do exist today. Moving on. So with that, we have a bunch of questions. Thank you all for hanging on so long. Um, I, and I'm going to pass it to uh, Walter. Great. Natalia, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the presenters who walked us through. Um, here you'll see on the slide, and I'll bring in um, Kaylin from CalPerg and some, uh, Sam from NextGen about additional steps for action that you can take. We'll also be sending out to 